Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Steve Stefaletto from State University of New York at Erie, often referred to as just SUNY Erie. Our former name was Erie Community College, or ECC. Today, I want to discuss visual color assessment. Notice that I have the word visual underscored, underlined to give it emphasis. And notice the red do not measure ruler. So this presentation is going to be talking about the visual color assessment. In a later future presentation, we'll talk about color assessment with instrumentation by the numbers. There's several advantages of visual color assessment. The first one is it doesn't cost you anything. It's free. Now this may seem trivial, but if you're going to buy a modern spectrophotometer, for example, an X-ray Exact Basic, it's over seven and a half thousand dollars. If you bought the advanced model, it's about nine and a half thousand dollars. And if you bought the plus scan option, that's an additional one and a half thousand dollars. So we're talking about an investment here of near eleven thousand dollars. Now, there have been some recent developments in smaller pocket size portable spectrophotometers. For example, the two that come to mind are Variable, which is $300, and Nix, which is about $1.3,000. Your eyes are always with you. They're ready at any time. You're very familiar and comfortable with your eyes. You've been using them for your entire lifetime. Your eyes are probably the same method that most of your customers are going to use to judge the color and the eye is an excellent null detector when you use a paired comparison reference. Now a null detector means it's the same or it's different. And the eye is a practical approach for evaluating complex busy pictorial images like photographs. So with spot colors obviously you measure a solid, but with photographs which are made out of halftone screen dots, where do you measure? There's always advantages and disadvantages, pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses. So let's talk about some of the disadvantages of visual color assessment. The first is it's very subjective. It's an opinion because it's, it's connected to your brain. And once you get your brain involved, there's all type of psychological effects occurring. Everyone sees color differently. Some people are colorblind or have poor color acuity. It's very subjective. It's not objective, so no numbers result. Now you need to use word adjectives to communicate to other people what you're seeing. And vision is dependent on the viewing and the, the surround conditions, your state of adaptation. Let's discuss the visual lighting and viewing conditions in more detail. We want to follow ISO 3664, which determines the correlated color temperature of 5000 Kelvin and a surround of Munsell N8. You probably want to have your judges evaluated for their color acuity. So a very popular test is the Farnsworth Munsell 100 hue test. Here's a link to do an online version of the test. Judges, we have to test them for consistency. So the analogy I use is like a baseball game. Is the umpire being consistent when they call on their balls and strikes? If they're all high or they're all on the inside, you don't care because you can compensate for that consistency. And then the reference target is probably a physical aim, the Pantone color guide swatch book, the fan guides. So we want to test that physical against numerical to see if it passes. And we have to be concerned about its expiration, its condition, and its uniformity of printing. Let's define a paired comparison. Uh, this photograph here you might remember from the uh, 1987 to 1995 TV comedy show, The Full House. That's Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen, the twins. So if I have two things, it's a pair, and I often call them a this and the that. Now the this could be a pre-press proof, and the that could be a press okay. And when you compare the pre-press proof to the press OK, we call that deviation, which is an intercomparison between two things. And that typically will have more variation. The other comparison can be the reference standard, the target aim, versus the sample, the batch, or the lot. This would be called variation. It's intra within variation, and it's typically less. So the purpose for doing this paired comparison is to answer the question of what is the quality or what is the accuracy of the match between these two things, the pair. Now, obviously, the size, the area, and the proximity, the closeness of the this and the that have an influence on the sensitivity. So the larger, the more sensitive, 
and the closer, the more sensitive. So here's my workflow for color communication. With your eyes, you're going to look and you're going to see the color. That gets sent to your brain and you're going to think about and judge the color. Then with your mouth, you're going to speak and talk about what you just saw. And then with someone else's ears, they're going to hear and listen about what you just said. So if you want effective and efficient color communication, communication is based on a language and language is based on terms. And those terms have to have definitions. So we want to share these common terms so that our language can be very effective for communication. Now that we've looked at this pair, we have to make a decision, a judgment about the degree of their color match accuracy. So I would put these into three categories or classifications. The first one would be same. When they're the same, it's obvious. People don't disagree about this. So you would, you would run it. You make money by running. The other category would be close. And here, people do disagree about how close it is. Is it close enough? Is it good enough? Is it the same as the, the before or the last time we ran it? If it's a question, we might want to run it anyways, but put it on hold for QC to, to review. And then the third category would be they're different. Again, here, it's obvious. So people don't disagree when they're the same. People don't disagree when they're different. People typically disagree when they're close. Now, if it's different, you obviously cannot ship this. You can't run it. Many times you might have to pull the job. Now, unfortunately, you can't use a three category classification. And then, of course, the final decision is a binary decision. It's either pass, fail, accept, reject, good, no good. Now, of course, your decision here depends on many things. You have to consider the expectations, the needs, the wants of the customer. You have to consider man internal manufacturing and productivity efficiencies. And you have to consider often the schedule, how late is the job in the schedule. And another comment about the same category, same means you don't see a difference. So that's called a J and D, just noticeable difference. And typically this is about a delta E of 1.0. Okay, so we've looked at it. We made a decision about pass or fail. Now, if it fails, we have to know why it's failing or how the color is different so that we can take corrective action. So color is three-dimensional. You need three letters or three numbers to completely describe the color. I like to think of this as like a GPS global positioning system where we have latitude, longitude, and altitude. By the way, most smartphones, GPSs are accurate to within 16 feet. You can think of that 16 feet area as being like a delta E, you're on target or you're off of target. But when we get to color, the color is either X, Y, Z, tristimulus values, or Y, X, Y, chromaticity coordinates, or LAB, which is Cartesian, or LCH, which is polar, HVC, hue, value, chroma, RGB, red, green, blue, which is an additive system used on computer displays, or CMY, which is a subtractive system, which is used in most printing devices, inkjet and laser toner. Is the color lighter or darker? Is it cleaner or dirtier? And in terms of hue, is it colder or warmer? Now this illustration right here is an ellipsoid, and an ellipsoid is a three-dimensional object. It has three axes, X, Y, Z, or L, A, B, or L, C, H. And when you interpret the lighter, darker, cleaner, dirtier, colder, warmer, you look at the largest magnitude values first. Okay, so if it's lighter or darker, that's an ink film thickness or an IFT issue. The more ink film thickness, the darker. The less ink film thickness, the lighter. So this is typically the solid ink density or SID. The higher the density, the darker, the lower the density, the lighter. And in flexography, this would be the analox volume, the BCM, billion cubic micron. And for dot area or dot gain, tone value increase, TBI, this is for the screen tints. Obviously, in flexography and gravure, the viscosity has an effect on the ink film thickness. And some inks, based on their spectral reflectance curve shape, their hue changes as you change the ink film thickness. So a classic example is orange. Orange will get yellow when it gets lighter, and orange will get redder when it gets darker. So it's important to get the color to standard L-star or standard ink film thickness solid ink density before you evaluate the other characteristics of the color. So 
for many years, we've had this software option called Best Match, where the software will predict and estimate the delta E when the L star is at its correct target value. Cleaner or dirtier, this is a reference to the chroma chromaticity saturation, which is relative to an equivalent gray value. So the color is either dirty or muddy. If you add black, you always make the color dirty and muddy. Adding black now makes the color a shade. Adding opposite complements will also make the color dirty because they're contaminants. So yellow plus blue will be black. White, which is polychromatic, all colors, is also dirty. And this can be caused by pinholing in the solid ink or when you add white to an ink, it then becomes a tint. So if you add black to an ink and it's a shade and you add white to an ink and it's a tint, then if you add gray to an ink, it becomes a tone. So we have shades, tints, and tones. Now a common reason why an ink formulated in the kitchen would fail a delta E on press is because the press did a poor wash up. So some of the previous colors is still there, it's residual, and it's contaminating the ink color. Now offset lithography typically is a wet trapping process, so the inks will have an opportunity to back trap contaminate. This doesn't happen on heat set web presses or sheet fed presses that are used in UV or typically in flexography and gravure where we dry trap. The other option is the color is colder or warmer. This is its hue. So hue is that predominant basic color name that we give. Neutral colors are technically hueless. They're achromatic without color. Again, we know that the three neutral colors are black, white, and gray, shades, tints, and tones. Neutrality means equality. So if I have equal amounts of red, green, blue light, or I have equal amounts of cyanogenic yellow density, you're equal, therefore you're neutral. However, this is not true for cyanogenic yellow dot size area or dot gain. You need unequal, unbalanced TVI to produce a neutral. For example, at the 50% midtone, you typically would have 50 cyan, 40 magenta, 40 yellow, zero black, to get gray balance. So if you're not neutral, you're either on the cold side, cold cast, or on the warm side, warm cast. And the three colors that are cold are blue plus green and cyan. The three colors that are on the warm side or the hot side are magenta, yellow, and red. So these color casts or color biases uh, in photography is called color balance. In printing, we call it gray balance. If you think about lighting conditions, the correlated color temperature or CCT, the luminant A is a very warm color where D50 is typically neutral and D65 is on the cold, cool side. Now, I know this presentation is titled Visual Color Assessment, and eventually we want to talk about how we measure color numerically with instrumentation. But before we can understand the meaning of the numbers provided by the instrument, we need to understand the three attributes or dimensions of the color. And this is typically done with Munsell Hue Value Chroma or CIE LAB LCH. Now the instrument is trying to model human perception. So always look before you measure the color. If you measure the color first and then look at the color, You've just biased yourself. So it's like trying to judge someone's weight after they've already stepped on a scale and you've looked at their weight. Okay, so we've already said that the color can be same, close, or different. And if it's different, it's lighter or darker, cleaner or dirtier, colder or warmer. Those attributes are called value, chroma, and hue. And if we measure them in C space, that would be the delta E, the L star, the C star, and the H angle. Now there's been many, many visual exercises done on this. Hue is the most important attribute or characteristic. Chroma is in the middle, medium, and lightness, darkness is the least. So this is the priority or the ranking of the importance of those three dimensions of color. When we get to spot color matching, not process color, spot color only, 
We can classify the Delta E based on the marketplace or the customer requirements. So we can be high, medium, and low. High might be sheet fed, folding cart, and packaging for the cosmetics industry. Medium might be other packaging industries, flexible packaging, wide web, or narrow web. And then low would be typically commercial printing and certainly things like publication printing for magazines, book publication, corrugated printing, and certainly newspaper printing. If you're in the high market, you would say that a delta E of less than one is the same, a delta E between one and two is close, and a delta E of over two is different. But again, this is for the very high end of the market. By the way, the low category is often referred to as pleasing color or close enough color. Now, having different categories of quality is not uncommon. Think about the uh, grades used in the paper industry or, or lumber for wood or in the meat industry. So think about USDA, uh, United States Department of Agriculture. They'll have three categories of meats, prime cut, choice cut, select cut. Think about the automobile industry. General Motors will have three different types of brands. Their low end is Chevy, their middle end is Buick, and the top of the line for quality is Cadillac. So these are often determined by the type of substrate you're going to be printing on. Think about a number one versus a number three sheet, or a coated sheet versus an uncoated sheet or an SBS solid bleach sulfite versus a CCNB clay coated newsback. And just a reminder here, we've already determined that a just noticeable difference, J and D, is a delta E of one. Okay, let's talk about tolerance limits. This could be a controversial, sensitive topic. I believe tolerance limits should be mutually agreed upon by both the producer, the printer, and the buyer, the customer. They should not be dictated. They should be based on past historical performance results. They should consider statistical process capability, the CP and CPK index. Is your process actually capable of meeting these requirements? They should be achievable and realistic. It's like when you set goals and objectives, you want to follow the SMART principle. They should be simple, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. They should be what the customer needs, that's a shall, not what they want, that's a should. We know that they often ask for what they want rather than what they need because how many times have we either intentionally or unintentionally shipped product out the back door that we knew was out of specification, but the customer never verbally complained or rejected. The tolerance limits are directly related to manufacturing costs in terms of labor and materials. So tighter tolerances take more effort, take more time. You have to be more careful. So there's more expense involved. In closing, any color assessment method, whether it be visual or instrumental, should begin and end with visual. Most customers don't have spectrophotometers, so they're going to look at the color to determine its acceptability quality. There are strengths and weaknesses to both visual and instrument assessment. This presentation is only for visual. There are strengths and weaknesses to physical and digital standards. So we're seeing a trend in the industry to get away from physical standards and go to digital standards. That will be an issue if you're only going to use visual assessment. An instrumental measurement should have a strong correlation to visual assessment, Delta E2000, is about 95% accurate. And visual is the ultimate gold standard that instrumentation is trying to model. Now, it's not a case of either or. You're either going to look at it or you're going to measure it. It's really a case of using both technologies or methods so that you supplement one with the other. Finally, thank you for your time and your attention. I hope you found this presentation interesting and informative. Please provide feedback with comments and questions. Goodbye now.